want to talk a bit about AML and my story as an AML caregiver. And the first, I talk about a series of things that has happened over the last nine years in this journey of acute myeloid leukemia that uh, my wife has experienced and I experienced with her as, as her primary caregiver and a journey together uh, up to this point and, and as we go forward. So uh, on this show, I want to talk about uh, that first phone call and tell a story. Uh, this is for intended really for people who uh, are going through this now or uh, are either as the, the patient or caregiver or somebody who has um, is closely related to or uh, friends with somebody who is going through AML. And uh, it, it explores some of the things that um, the moments through this journey. Uh, so one day, it was a Thursday on January 15th, 2014. Uh, I'm a software engineer and I was in a meeting with another, with a, with a vendor and we were exploring uh, it closing on a contract. And so I was very focused on uh, what what we were doing that day. And I, uh, I remember turning my phone, my mobile phone off, um, or at least I had it face down. I had it face down, but it was um, a head on buzz. And, uh, and my phone buzzed. Um, it's like, okay, that's in the back of my mind. I'm thinking, okay, that's something I need to look at once I'm done with this meeting. It was about 3 30, I guess, in the afternoon. And, uh, so we kept, we kept talking and going on and it buzzed again. And then uh, a few minutes later, it was a, a, a buzz and another buzz close together. And, uh, so, so I picked up the phone to take a look and I saw there was a number of texts and, and missed voice messages. So um, I looked at the text and, and it was um, it was Judy, my wife, who um, was saying, where are you? Um, and uh, I listened to the voice message and it was about, um, uh, it was my wife's doctor at the time uh, calling me um, to, to, uh, to talk to me. And then uh, another message of my wife calling uh, saying my doctor wants to talk to me her doctor wants to talk to me and I should call back. Um, and, and then, um, so I, I stepped out for a moment, uh, and I, I made that call. And so I, I called Judy and Judy says, Hey, uh, I, uh, I, my doctor wants to talk to you. We have a problem. Um, I need to go to the emergency room. And uh, I need you to come. I need you to be here. So um, she handed the phone over to the doctor, and the doctor proceeded to tell me that my wife had something called acute myeloid leukemia, and it was emergency. It was serious, and uh, she needed to go to Boston immediately. And uh, I either needed, if, if I was going to bring her to Boston, I needed, needed to uh, to head up to the the, the doctor's office now. Um, immediately, or he was going to put her in an ambulance center in Boston. And we lived about 40 minutes, 40 minutes to an hour outside of Boston. Uh, and where I worked was in between there. So I had to come north first uh, to get her and then and then head into Boston. Um, so I excused myself from the from the vendor meeting, packed everything up, and headed, headed north. So uh, I got there. She was waiting. Um, the doctor had already uh, closed out, had, had already left, but she was um, she was waiting by the entrance, and uh, she had brought her car there, so we decided to do it at at that hospital, and and uh, uh, this was uh, Anna Jake's hospital in Liverpool, and then uh, head down to Boston. Well, um, she she 
filled me in along the way. And uh, I guess um, back a while back, um, she had a series of blood tests about a year ago. And uh, the doctor had noted that there was some a change in the size of red cells. Uh, but didn't he just marked that he wanted to watch it, didn't uh, think anything of it uh, beyond that. Um, but more recently, she had a nurse that was looking at uh, her blood work and uh, noticed that the red blood cells were huge. And uh, that's what tipped off seeing the doctor. Um, he talked to the doctor, I guess, and uh, got to be in there. And, uh, and the doctor had um, then explored with an oncologist on staff, um, assuming that this was probably what it meant, leukemia. Um, but he had uh, recognized that this is late stage leukemia and uh, it was life threatening at this point. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, we got to, uh, we were heading to Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. Now, one of the things, the great things about living in New England is that we have a lot of great medical centers, uh, world known medical centers. A lot of people come here from all over the world uh, to, to be treated, especially for life threatening illnesses, um, surgeries, and uh, various procedures that are uh, not offered or, or not at the quality of, of uh, we find in Boston. So I feel fortunate about being in Boston. Um, so we get to, to Beth Israel and uh, we're met at the hospital emergency room. Uh, they're expecting us and uh, we were, uh, an oncologist came and, and got us and, and went to our, our exam room so we could have a conversation. And uh, he proceeded to tell us that um, Judy, you know, from his, his assessment, you did have a AML, acute myeloid leukemia. Um, we still didn't know what that was really at the time. But uh, he says, you know, we to put it bluntly, Judy, you have six weeks to live. Uh, and that's it. And uh, it's, it's pretty serious. So it was a shocker. It was like, what? What did you just say? Are you sure? <laughs> And he says, unless we, we uh, start treatment immediately, um, you know, we can do chemotherapy and a number of other things to, to, to increase your odds. But your odds are about um, one in five that you survive this. Now, that's pretty scary. 20% chance of survival. Um, this is, you know, coming from our lives to hearing this news was... Um, a shocker hadn't really sunk in yet as we were talking about it. And uh, he says, well, and, and we can only really do what we want to do if we have a donor match for um, stem cell therapy. We'd have to uh, replace your your stem cells. So, uh, but he couldn't get into the details of it at that point, only that we had to um, get her admitted. Um, this was an inpatient thing that was going to take she had to be in the hospital for weeks, if not months. Um, so uh, now, AML. What is it? What? what why does it happen? Um, it, it's it's cancer. So it's it's cancer of the blood. It's cancer of the stem cells. The um, red cells aren't being properly manufactured from uh, from the T cells. Uh, the, the stem T cells. And so um, essentially we have to reboot our system in order to, to get T cells that will generate red cells correctly. That's the idea. Um, but this is, you know, there, there's, there's any number of reasons why leukemia happens, um, but it's a body's reaction to foreign substance. And uh, and Judy was a smoker. She, at this point, she's been smoking for 30 years. Um, she's been smoking since she was a teenager. And uh, she attempted to stop a few times, but but didn't. Um, she, she did during a pregnancy of her um, our children, uh, each of her two children, but um, then went back to it as a, as a, a crutch and, and a, something she, did, she liked doing, um, but probably. It was very calming for her. And uh, 
he, the, the oncologist said to us, you have to stop smoking. You cannot be smoking and proceeding with this treatment. Uh, we won't do it if you're going to continue to smoke. So you have to stop immediately. <clears throat> now, this is cold turkey. <laughs> and she's like, uh, that's going to be tough. And uh, he said, well, you know, if, if, the, if, you, if your reason for stopping is big enough, you'll stop. And so she's, all right, well, can I have one last smoke? And he said, okay, one. And that's it. Um, you can go out to the entrance of the emergency room. So we did. We went out there and we we talked about, wow, this is this is real. This is happening to us. This is a big deal. And she's dragging, taking a drag on her last cigarette. She put it out, crumpled the pack, threw it in the trash, and never smoked again. Uh, that that was a huge turning point for her uh, on many levels. So we got back inside. The oncologist said, well. Uh, you need to stay the night uh, here in the emergency room, and uh, then we'll we'll get you checked into the oncology uh, floor. And uh, said to me, he says Dave, you need to uh, go home, get some sleep, and get back here in the morning. Um, if you're not going to work tomorrow, you're you're going to be here as we uh, get Judy prepped and and uh, ex <clears throat> explore more about what your treatment regime is going to be. Uh, the other thing he had mentioned was that, you know, we need to find a donor. So we need to, uh, you know, he asked about how many siblings she had. Uh, and, you know, Judy came from a, a family of six, so she's got uh, six children. So she's got five siblings that we can um, test to see if they're uh, a donor match. <clears throat> so that was something we need to explore the next day, but uh, something I need to think about. Uh, is spreading the word to family and uh, reaching out to each of her siblings to ask that they would get tested uh, to be a donor. Um, so this was a big deal. This is, uh, you know, we went through this um, cycle of initially disbelief, right? Uh, that's the first reaction when you hear shocking news like this. Uh, followed by a reaction of, well, why and why does it happen to me now? And, and you know, if this is real, if this is real um, why didn't we know earlier? What, why is this a, such a surprise and a, a, uh, a shocker? Um, and uh, then realizing, wow, this is really happening to us and we need to uh, embrace the situation and move forward with it. Uh, and uh, we knew this was the beginning of a journey that was going to be life-changing, life-altering. Little did we know how much it was uh, even more significant life-altering than, than we knew at the time. But, um, but I think the big thing was that um, we needed to do the right thing for Judy uh, to, to assure the best possible survival. Um, you know, our children were in of college years and they were both in school um you know i uh we both worked um you know life life was good at the at this time and and uh, uh that that just was going to be changing and uh, i had to also let work go you know what how do i tell them uh, maybe keep it quiet for the moment uh, just that i'm taking the day uh and uh for emergency reasons and, and leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> so um, bottom line on this, you know, there was an eye opener that uh, you know, we, we know that smoking kills. Uh, we've had other relatives and especially on Judy's side that uh, have um, had cancer in various forms and have, have passed away. Um, cancer of the brain, cancer of the throat, cancer of uh, various parts of the body. Um, so we know that, <clears throat> that cancer, smoking kills. <clears throat> it's just a matter of when and how. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, one of the things we also uh, had talked about was uh, wh why now? Because uh, Judy, um, you know, my mom had passed only a few months earlier. Um, 
she she was in for my parents um, and my siblings uh, live in Hawaii. So um, that was a big deal was uh, getting out to Hawaii, seeing my mom uh, and, you know, just before she passed and then uh, going through that exercise and mourning her. Um, and then Judy's mom had passed only the week before, um, days before, really. And so Judy was in mourning of her mom and losing both moms that close together was a big deal uh, for us. And um, doctors theorized that she probably had her guard up um, and was fighting leukemia for a year uh, as it progressed. And um, although some symptoms and signs may have been there, they weren't so apparent until her mom passed. And in her mourning, she let her guard down and uh, the leukemia just kind of rushed in and, and became very symptomatic at that point. She was very tired, very fatigued, um, and uh, she just didn't have any energy. It was sapping her of her energy, and uh, and she knew something was wrong. She actually, I remember looking back, uh, only I think before my my mom had passed, so probably six months back, she said to me, uh, "I think I'm dying." And she told me this several times. She didn't know why. Um, she just did. She had this sixth sense about it. Um, and that, that's kind of an eye opener, right? She she knew that. Um, of course, no one believed her. <laughs> and uh, myself included, that, oh, she's just overreacting to other things going on in her life. But no, she probably did have a sixth sense at that time that this was going on. And uh, it wasn't until her mom's death that we realized that, um, you know, in hindsight that, uh, you know, this had accelerated to the point where now her life was uh, threatened. And uh, I, I was facing losing both moms and my wife in a short period of time if we didn't fight for this. So the fight's on, um, you know, that was the beginning of the journey. And, uh, from there, we'll, we'll explore more about this journey, but uh, this was the beginning. So um, that's the story. 